I wanted to uh, recognize Governor Cooper of North Carolina in absentia because our next panel uh, is going to focus on the whole of state approach to cybersecurity and it's going to include a particular focus on North Carolina and the North Carolina Cyber Task Force. Um, and uh, Governor Cooper as well has been a very active player in the cybersecurity space. So momentarily, we're going to have uh, our next panel come to the fore uh, to include moderator Doug Robinson of the National Association of State CIOs, uh, as well as Secretary Jim Weaver of the state of North Carolina, who is secretary and CIO, Rob Main, who is the state chief risk officer, and uh, two gentlemen from the National Guard, Lieutenant Colonel Robbie Felicio, who is the CIO for the Army National Guard, and Lieutenant Colonel Seth Baroon, who is chief of cyber operations for the North Carolina Army National Guard. Gentlemen, as soon as you're up here, the floor is all yours. All right, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the uh, another version of the uh, NGA Summit. NASIO is uh, pleased to partner with NGA and have since the inception uh, of this meeting many years ago uh, to bring the states together, and particularly to bring all the state agencies and other actors together that are involved in, um, in cybersecurity. Uh, quite frankly, this is an attempt to deflect the responsibility of cybersecurity away from the CIO, who, as you all know, in state government means career is over, uh, to at least the, uh, the CISO, which means career is suddenly over, and to the, the, the National Guard, who will be in place long after the ashes have blown away from our other members. So uh, we, have, we have fun with this. So uh, we're going to have a, uh, a great session and a conversation today about whole of state cybersecurity. And we'll talk a little bit about that term. We have uh, a plenty of time to have that conversation. And it will be a conversation. And we'll learn uh, through my probing and insightful questions uh, and their informative and educated responses. Um, so I'm setting them up for success here. Uh, we will uh, we'll be talking about uh, the state of North Carolina and their model for whole of state. Whole of state, uh, and particularly the whole of government concept, whole of government term, NACIO started using that about six or seven years ago. Uh, we focused on our 2016 Cyber Disruption Response Guide, Planning Guide, which we are working on revising that and issuing a new version of that, uh, with the concept of, of kind of whole of government and really expanded that and have over the years to talk about whole of state. Uh, and we think that's more appropriate at this point. And by whole of state, uh, we mean really the, the, the example of bringing, as you, as you heard Governor Hutchinson talk about, the not only local governments, but other jurisdictions as well, political subdivisions, uh, the planning agencies, but also the other branches of government, uh, bringing in the National Guard as a partner, bringing in the state police, bringing in emergency management, and looking at those private companies, looking at private utilities, looking at health care. So if you look at the evolution of what states have done, uh, since the first kind of cyber disruption plan and, and the whole of, of state model was incorporated by several states, you see that they have expanded the universe. And so the, the whole of state concept for cybersecurity is particularly around uh, cultivating relationships. It's less about cybersecurity, it's more about cultivating relationships. And it generally that started in an informal manner and now has grown, I think, across many states. Uh, to, to, in, to that formal structure that we will talk about today with North Carolina, which is a, which is a great example of, of partnership. And, and the second thing I'll, I'll talk, what I'll talk about is the fact that uh, this needs to be strengthened across the states in terms of its, uh, its scope and applicability. 2020, our national survey showed that about 25% of the states uh, were at the, what I, they would characterize in a whole of state model. Uh, 60 some percent were aspiring, they were building toward that model. Uh, and, and the remainder were still unsure of what they should be doing. So I think to protect the states uh, in, a, in a holistic fashion, uh, the whole of state approach really needs to be embraced uh, by all states. And that means bringing all of the, uh, the actors together of the executive branch and certainly uh, working uh, to bring in the other organizations, I call them uh, within NASIO, the You're Not the Boss of Me organizations, such as Secretary of State and the Attorney General's Office and many others that don't fall under the authority and purview of the state of the state CIO. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about, talk about today. So again, we have uh, uh, a uh, group of experts up here from the state of North Carolina. 
Uh, Secretary uh, Weaver, Secretary Jim Weaver and CIO from the state, Rob Main, Chief Risk Officer down there. We have uh, both our Lieutenant Colonels here, Lieutenant Colonel Brent, who's the Chief Cyber Operations, and you heard uh, Lieutenant Colonel Felicio, who is the CIO of the uh, Army National Guard. Both of these gentlemen here representing North Carolina Army National Guard, and they have a very strong and, and uh, formal relationship with the North Carolina Department of Information Technology, and which we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll get into Get into that. So I'm going to start with Jim. My main challenge today is to keep Jim in line. The other guys don't, <laughs> are not members of my, of my group. So that's, I will tell you, that's my major challenge. So uh, let's, let's talk about the North Carolina version of whole of state. So Secretary Weaver, your, uh, when you think about whole of state, what does that encompass for North Carolina? Sure, and I guess I should first start off that you can tell which one of us is retired from the military and which of us are still active in the military. So. Um, <laughs> So just as a matter of full disclosure, when I do put the OCPs on, I am working for these two gentlemen on, on weekends. So it really does bring it together very nicely um, here in North Carolina. You know, Governor Hutchinson said a lot of great things there, and we're very fortunate with Carolina. Governor Cooper is extremely focused on cybersecurity. The only thing that's more important uh, in his uh, directives to me is broadband and delivery of broadband across the state of North Carolina. But cybersecurity is a very close second. Uh, and to the point where at every cabinet meeting there is a cybersecurity update that's provided to him um, at a high level, just giving him um, the, you know, the facts and the bottom line up front as to what is occurring in our state, um, active incidents that are underway that he should be aware of. Um, and if, we, if we're seeing anything from the foreign, you know, the uh, geopolitical events that are occurring over in Eastern Europe, if there's any impacts from that whatsoever, just making him aware. But when we talk about whole estate, in North Carolina, we, we, we define government as K through 12 local government, state government, and higher ed components as well. Um, we are very fortunate in North Carolina that we recently, in January, went into law. We had legislation that prevents the payment of ransomware. So in North Carolina, no governmental entity can negotiate or pay for ransomware. That's uh, another huge uh, bonus in our arsenal. Um, we're also looking at, um, besides these guys, we'll be talking a lot about the formation of the Joint Cyber Task Force. Um, all the various components in there, but there are, we're very fortunate to have what we call Nickel Giza, which is North Carolina Local Government Information Systems Association. God bless so, you. Yes, yeah, so as, <laughs> so seeing a lot of colleagues in the military out there, we love our acronyms, so uh, we know what those things mean. But it really gives us the, the tip of the spear, if you will, to interface and interact with government at all levels um, within the state of North Carolina. So it's not state government, it's not Raleigh rolling in to take over a situation, it is their peers. It's their counterparts throughout the state that are coming in and helping out. Um, and, it, and it's that 24-hour notification period that's required by state law to inform us of cyber incidents. When that scoping call, or as that scoping call is getting identified, we are already getting boots on ground. So um, a lot of our National Guard colleagues here are already dispatching and getting folks on ground to start assessing while that scoping call is going on. Um, you know, we have four primary entities that are involved, um, and I'm sure Rob and others will talk about that as well, but besides my agency, Department of Information and Technology, we obviously have our National Guard colleagues within the Department of Public Safety. We have Emergency Management, which is within our Department of Public Safety, and then, of course, we have Nickel Giza. Our federal partners are involved as needed to be, as, long as, as well as with state law enforcement. And then, depending on the type of situation that's being seen, we will bring other state agencies to bear. Obviously, if it's a K through 12 type um, situation, our Department of Public Instruction will be involved. Um, as we're looking, if it's a county government entity and it could be threatening of uh, human services, as an example, delivery of human services benefits, our Department of Health and Human Services will be involved. So we'll bring in these other entities as we need to to uh, fill out the team and be, in, be involved as the incident continues to go. One of the other things that we're very fortunate to be able to do in North Carolina, though, is um, we have an IT strategy board that's really focusing on uh, assisting me, as you will, to, to look at um, the future of North Carolina and where we're heading. And one of our subcommittees is focused on cybersecurity. And I'm sure all states have this issue, but in North Carolina right now, we have 21,000 open cybersecurity jobs across the state. We have a talent pipeline shortage. So as we talk about the whole of, of cybersecurity, is we're, we're trying to figure out ways to address that. So we're working with the uh, University of North Carolina system, our North Co uh, Carolina Community College system, to start getting credential professionals, credential students to come out and start to fulfill that pipeline need. But as we're working at the college level, we're also working at the high school level. 
And one of the areas that we, Governor Cooper has really helped us out a lot in pushing forward was Cyber Start America. This year, we were able to get over 1,500 high school children in, in the state of North Carolina across 162 school districts participating in this program, which is really an introductory to cyber. Um, it's capture the flag, it's that type of stuff, but you don't need to have a cyber background. You just um, need to have an interest. Um, this year, last year we had 18 uh, national winners. This year we have 24 national winners, uh, three of which won again from last year. So we had three juniors who are now seniors that have won as well. Very proud of that. But what that has opened up, given us is an opportunity now to start engaging our high schools a little bit differently. Uh, Rob has done a fantastic job of working with some of our local high schools and starting cyber clubs and engaging them on some of the things that are going on at the state level so they can start seeing it's not about red team activities, but blue team's where the real work is. Uh, red team's where all the fun is. Blue team, you can't be wrong. You gotta be right all the time. Um, so simple things like vulnerability management and what does that mean and how does that go? So we're, we're continuing to get our high school students engaged as well in this. As we're looking at uh, IIJA and the opportunities that IIJA brings forward, North Carolina is um, eligible to receive about $26.4 million. Um, and one of the benefits of having this group, the Joint Cyber Task Force, is that it's basically has given us our planning group. So uh, while we're waiting for the final notice of funding opportunity, or NOFO, uh, from CISA, um, we're already putting forward. So our National Guard colleagues have already gone out and done about 50% of the, of the county governments across the state of North Carolina have already done vulnerability assessments. We already have a good idea of what initiatives and what projects that we're going to want to go forward with, depending upon how the NOFO turns out. We're assuming it's going to be one way, but you never know um, with, uh, when it comes down from the federal government. So we want to make sure that we're aligned and, and ready to, to move forward on those opportunities that are there. The other area, too, is privacy. Governor uh, Hutchinson talked about privacy. We, in December, the governor allowed me to go ahead and hire a chief privacy officer. So we have our state's first ever chief privacy officer. Two sides of the coin. Her and Robert are, are joined together at the hip, and privacy is now being embedded in all our cybersecurity activities as well. So you can't do one without the other. So I, I think that as we're looking forward, as we're looking at emergency management, um, in, the, in our PSAP community, Next Gen 911 is one of my areas of responsibility. We've already gone out and done uh, cyber assessments of all county networks that are interacting on our Next Gen 911 um, network and already have what those uh, vulnerability assessments look like. And because of the FCC rule change, we're able to now leverage 911 funds to go ahead and mitigate and remediate those findings as well. We're going to be starting that in, as part of our budget here starting in July 1. So I think those are some of the interesting opportunities when we talk about um, holistic state approach and some of the things we're doing here in North Carolina, Doug. I have a follow-up question. I hesitate to ask this because that was just your opening statement. So <laughs> we'll, 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 get, we'll, get back to, we'll get back to Jim. So, Man, I, I, I got to do something. I know. Are my dues going up for I, 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 want, I want these other gentlemen to get a chance to speak. Uh, no. So you mentioned higher education. You mentioned... Mm -hmm. uh, higher education as a partner in talent management and development. There's either side of that on the governance side. What's the, in, in this whole estate model, what's the, I guess, role and authority of the CIO and the chief risk officer vis-a-vis uh, -vis higher education, which is, creates a lot of tension in other states in terms of the oversight role because, again, they're part of that, you're not the boss of me confederation and they seem, they really want to be independent, so. Yeah. I think relationship's the key word and yeah. I will, Rob has done a lot, right. so go ahead, Rob. Certainly. Rob. Well, first of all, I want to thank the state of Ohio for hosting us, the NGA, and NASIO for uh, putting on this event. So we are very early on in our walk with partnering with our university system. Uh, there's some statutory requirements of reporting significant cybersecurity incidents that there was a certain sense of hesitancy for UNC system schools to really grab a hold of that. So. As we demonstrate the capability of the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force, which I'll get into here in, in a future question on its composition and uh, origination. As we demonstrate the capabilities of the JCTF as it's known, you'll, we see more and more interest in, from the university system in coming to us for support, whether it be proactive or reactive capabilities that our partners with the National Guard bring to bear as well as our Nickel G's IT cybersecurity strike team. Mm -hmm. So that's a good segue. Let's transition to that. So I guess I'll start with uh, I'll start with Seth. Maybe what's the uh, relationship um, that has been established between um, information technology and the guard? 
and how is that how is that constructed? Is it informal, formal, and how has it evolved? So it started as an informal um, agreement. Um, Robbie can probably speak back back to when it started, but um, you know it started as an informal agreement, um, and that relationship has, has grown. Um, one of the things, and these guys might get mad at me for saying this, but <laughs> DIT is Big Brother in, in North Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. And so. A lot of municipalities and counties are fine with the National Guard coming in, but they don't always want DIT there telling them you have to do this, you have to report that. And that's just a fact. That's, that's kind of the way that they look at it. And so mm -hmm. we work hand in hand together where you know, we know what, what DIT is looking for. Um, but when we go in to do a, a cyber hygiene assessment or a penetration test, that stays between us and the municipality. We will give recommendations to DIT and say, hey, here's the top 10 vulnerabilities we see across the board. But we don't share that data, and that's kind of that trust we have. Um, we, don't, we don't trust the specific data from that county, or we don't share that data. We, um, you know, it's only between us and the county, but you know, there's certain state agencies that have to report it up to DIT, and we won't even share that, even though we know they're going to get the report eventually. Mm -hmm. We are partners, but we have, to, we have to maintain that separate but equal relationship to keep that, that trust with the, with the municipalities and the, and the state agencies. So just yeah, go ahead, some, Rob. Yeah. some points of interest. So this started informally a little over 10 years ago. Uh, and, and really where it started was there was not an immediate need. And what do I mean by that is, is the very first thing we did with our partners is we had an MOU in place between the agencies and we worked to do an assessment at the very beginning, so before incident response was needed, we already had trust built, and that's key. So for us, at all levels, whether the state agency to begin with or conducting an incident response without trust, doesn't matter who you are, whether DIT, guard, any asset, that if, if you're the victim, you're gonna only allow certain people in. And we learned a long time ago that forcing your way into those incidents is not the way to go. So building those partnerships up front in a preventative measure is where to start. And we learned that this is a cycle. Things you have to do before an event takes place, things you have to do during an event takes place, things you have to do after an event takes place. Oh, and by the way, technology, threats, adversaries all change. So then you have to start it all over, right? But without the trust, you're not going to be there to help support, and you're going to be fighting an uphill battle. And we learned that a while ago informally to the point where we have now shifted into the formalization of the JCTS, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit. So, so when you think about those relationships with local jurisdictions, you've got obviously, I mean, you've got counties, you've got cities, you've got other special districts. How is that, is that an invitation for you to conduct an assessment or is that, or do you all broker that to them? How does that work or is it all, is all the way above? I'm gonna handle this. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, you know, we do a lot of advertising these days. Um, you know, we, we speak at, at all over the state, um, but also the Nickel GISA, which we talked about uh, previously, they are, the, they are in the counties, in the municipalities. They're the CIOs, uh, IT directors in those counties, and, you know, they're our partners as well. And so they're constantly saying, hey, this resource is available to you. Absolutely take advantage of it. And we've worked with them um, even on our reports to make them more uh, applicable to their infrastructure, right? Yeah. To the county or municipality infrastructure. Um, and so it's that, that sort of that relationship and that ongoing, um, you know, um, partnership that we have that um, at this point we are booked out for, for, our, um, for our assessments all the way through the spring, pen tests um, all the way through this year because th that demand is out there and, and the word is out there that, hey, the National Guard is gonna come on ground and do this for you. Um, and so it's, it's been, it was slow to ramp up. I gotta be honest with you, a couple of years ago when we, we started to do this full time, you know, we were really calling, we were cold, essentially cold calling and saying, mm -hmm. hey, uh, are you guys interested in this? Um, and then, and now, you know, we just have a, it's a fairly robust system where we're scheduling months, months out. And I think the key thing there, Doug, is, and a lot of our um, county and local government entities didn't realize was it's at no cost to them. Mm -hmm. We're accounting for the cost of these services at the state level. Yeah, I mean, that, inquiring wines out there are saying, this sounds great, guys, but who's paying for this? So who's paying? So part, part of, um, there's money that's in my budget that I do a transfer over to uh, Secretary Buffalo, who's in the audience, who oversees Department of Public Safety. The National Guard uh, rolls in under, under him. Um, but we, we are transferring money over that accounts for a lot of the uh, state active duty time that's being done at the National Guard side. 
So at any given time, we're normally averaging around 15, 16 um, National Guard men and women, boots on ground, if you will, doing a myriad of services. We leverage these services as well at the state side. So uh, as we have state agencies that need vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, whatever, this is a awesome resource for us to tap into as well. Um, and in, you know, again, it's a great use of state money. Um, it's getting state relevant money training. as in general fund appropriation, state money as state in general fund, general fund. fund. Right. Okay, so you're not taking out of your chargeback hides. So no. State no. agencies aren't paying for this under the covers. No, no, okay, don't. Okay, good. So your customers, not a good word with me, your does, customers so don't are go happy because it's a general <laughs> fund. Okay, that's, that's an important yes, consideration. Yes. Okay. But as we've been showing the success for the first time last year in the budget uh, that the governor signed in November, we've, this first time we were able to secure reoccurring funding for the state of North Carolina on cybersecurity. So the program and the success of the program is, is really helping us with the General Assembly as well and, and their understanding of, of the criticality of what's going on across the state of North Carolina. So it's a huge win for us around the, on all cylinders. It helps that we did an assessment for the General Assembly also. So we, show, yeah. we showed them you know, what it, that it's worth it, the investment. So. And do you all work with, you mentioned the, the association, do you all work with other associations, Association of Counties and others to build that awareness and understanding? Yeah, so yes. we have a dedicated person that focuses in on outreach and training. Outreach and training, and so okay. So as we work through different events, we learn of a new partner, and then we work to get them to the table so that we just have a conversation. And most of the time it brings on a lot of good questions, some of which nobody at the table has thought to ask. And I think that's where the JC Joint Cyber Task Force comes in. Sorry about the acronym. Mm -hmm. But where it comes in is everyone understands their authority and what they actually bring to the table, the benefits that come to the table from the guard, DIT, the local community, emergency management. We all have a specific role to play. And when everyone comes together, we can almost always solve a problem, no matter where mm -hmm. it's at, at the local level or at the state level. Mm -hmm. So the cybersecurity response kind of force, is that totally under the guard or is uh, Rob, you involved in that? How does that, how does that work? So as Colonel Felicio indicated earlier, the, the beginnings of the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force as it exists today span back you know, many, many, many years ago. Um, both Colonel Felicio and I were involved in that initial engagement. And it's become what it is through Executive Order 254, which Governor Cooper signed on March 16th of this year. As the, the geopolitical tensions in Eastern Europe were rising, Governor Cooper wanted to have a briefing on the state of cybersecurity, a uh, closed briefing where all of our partners um, on the stage today, in addition to uh, our partners with the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management, provided that real-time assessment of where we were at with the task force, and Governor Cooper asked, how can I help? So we laid out a plan to formalize the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force mm -hmm and really engage our critical infrastructure and key resources partners. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, that there's, there's limitations to the governor's authority over private sector entities in North Carolina. So as we were coming up with the language for that executive order, we really wanted to break it down into two different sections. First, formalization and identification of the core members and equal partners within the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force. It was mentioned earlier, but just as a quick rundown, our agency, the De Department of Information Technology, the North Carolina National Guard Cybersecurity Response Force, the Nickel GISA, as it's known, IT Cyber Strike Team, as well as the Division of Emergency Management. And as Colonel Felicio just mentioned, each one of those core members bring a specific capability to bear. And through our partners with the Division of Emergency Management, they provide the framework of emergency response mm -hmm. that our North, that North Carolinians are accustomed to for a wide variety of concerns, whether it be a natural disaster, civil unrest. We frame cyber incidents no differently than we do a hurricane. On a blue sky day, a cyber event is the victim's hurricane on that day. So it's absolutely essential component to the JCTF. The strength of the JCTF and the reason why we have had the level of success is that equal partnership and the egos being checked at the door. We're all you know, driving towards the same goal and that's, a, that's supporting those uh, municipalities, those counties, those areas of North Carolina that may be more financially distressed. So the first section of our executive order formalizes the JCTF. 
The second one is absolutely essential to our whole of state approach. We've mentioned our whole of state scope being our local governments, our K through 12s, our community colleges, our university system, our state agencies. But we also have a duty to engage with our critical infrastructure partners, utility providers, service providers that North Carolinians depend on. So there's, in the second section of our executive order, we lay out areas of strong encouragement for those critical infrastructure partners. The first is for them to share details of their public facing environment so we can, as a task force, assist them with proactive monitoring. Maybe we'll see something that they don't and we can alert them to it. The second area of strong encouragement is for them to report any incidents that are significant in nature to the JCTF so we have visibility and awareness. And the third is for, to allow the JCTF to come alongside that partner in their response and recovery activities. So the formalization, um, while it occurred after the war in, or as the war in Ukraine was building up or the geopolitical tensions were building up, it's an absolutely essential component to advertising, if you will, the capabilities of the JCTF to the areas of North Carolina that frankly may not know we exist. Even though we've been around for quite some time, we had a municipality in um, the eastern part of the state that was impacted by a ransomware incident, and they turned to a federal office, one of our federal partners in the eastern part of the state, completely unaware of how to report an incident and what resources we could bring to bear for them. And to quote one of the members of the uh, Cybersecurity Response Force, that recovery effort, slow is actually fast, and fast is actually slow. So if we take a pragmatic, structured, method, uh, methodical approach to response and recovery that the JCTF can bring to bear versus the quick fix and standing, some, standing your environment back up only for it to be reinfected if you don't take a methodical approach, that's what we're working against. So awareness of the capabilities of the JCTF, telling the success story, and partnerships where we demonstrate a value add to our supported entities across the state of North Carolina. So, so let's describe that maybe, and um, you obviously had a good use case there, but the, in terms of a, a, an incident, you've got, re, let's say, let's use ransomware, which is more likely today. You've got response, remediation, you've got recovery. You guys on the ground, hands on keyboards in that municipality? So uh, I'll give you an incident from yeah. Sunday. Tear it from uh, the headlines, Monday. go ahead. <laughs> Monday, um, you know, the, the way it works in North Carolina is we can get a report from anywhere. Um, it can come up through DIT, through their SOC. A lot of times it goes through emergency management, which is, um, you know, which is just find the, the fusion center. We'll get a notification, and then we'll stand up a call. Whoever gets the, whoever gets the, the notification, um, they'll send out a, a, a notification to the Joint Cyber Task Force, stand up a phone call, um, and usually within an hour we're all on the phone uh, with the affected agency um, having that conversation. Um, you know, and the way that we've built the Joint Cyber Task Force is that it's a, a, a standardized um, way of going about uh, an incident response. So it's a repeatable process. Um, and so we ask you know, fairly similar questions to everyone, um, but everybody's on the call, all the partners are on the call, and you know, immediately the National Guard um, will dispatch uh, four personnel um, to whatever agency it is. Um, and that's a, an incident response lead, um, a forensic analyst, a threat hunter, um, and then a scribe. And scribe sounds silly, but we've learned over time that the scribe is one of the most important people there. Somebody's got to write it down because IT people don't write down anything. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so, so those four people are on the ground, sometimes by the end of the phone call. Yeah. Um, and the fastest, uh, I think, was 45 minutes from the phone call. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, and, and if anybody's been through an incident response, you know that, that that first conversation, none of it's really what's happening. Um, and you start to try to get them to prepare. This is the stuff that we'd like to see when we get there. Um, and so, so when we get there, usually the Nickel GISA, depending on the agency, um, the Nickel GISA will, will join us there. Mm -hmm. um, and then emergency management, depending on what resources we need, emergency management will, will start to work on that. And then DIT can leverage sort of their enterprise solutions. If it's a state agency, then DIT is heavily involved in the response. Um, 
And it sort of just depends on the size of the response, how many people we, we bring to bear. And those, you know, typically I'll get a phone call from, from our incident response lead that says, hey, I need five more people or we're just gonna take forensic images like the one we have going on now. Everything's encrypted, so we're gonna do the forensics, um, but there's not a lot of threat hunting to be done because there's no logging, there's, there's nothing. So now we start the plan to rebuild. And that's where, you know, DIT plays a big part in that in terms of helping us with, you know, replanning a network, segmenting the network, bringing them back up the correct way. So that's kind of where, uh, how an incident response works for the, for the JCTF. So there's one additional part. Uh, at the very beginning, when the event, when the call comes in, you mentioned earlier about the education side of the house mm -hmm. and the partnerships there and how do you build that trust up front. So if it's a state agency that is impacted, immediately Rob has a relationship already with that state agency. So they've already been working together side by side. So from the education perspective, that's where the other partner at the JCTF comes in and they've already got that relationship. So as we're walking in, as he talked about earlier, there's a peer saying, hey, I've been there. I've done that. There's resources that have done this 100 times for our states. You can trust these individuals. Correct. That yeah. goes a long, long way. Yeah. And, and so that, let's, let's, say, ex, let's I, extend I, okay. that, and maybe Jim needs to answer this question. Okay. <laughs> so what if, that, what if that state agency was the court system? Are they going to call you? Uh, cross branch. The, the extent yeah. of the executive order and uh, our authorities under general statute uh, are, are you know, squarely on the executive branch, but I do have a relationship with the courts, and they're wanting to participate. They see the value that the JCTF provides to the executive branch and the whole state, and they're anxious to participate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the other thing is that we're vendor agnostic, right? We're not, we're not gonna come in, we're not a, a vendor, and we're not gonna say, you have to use you know, this solution, you have to use this. Tell us what you got, and, and we'll find the guy. And that's the great part of the guard, is you know, especially in, in the Raleigh area, we've got guys that work in all these different um, IT fields, you know, Cisco, NetApp, so we can find someone that, that on, the, on our M-Day side, on our traditional yeah. guard side, that can help with that technology, whereas, um, you know, a vendor may come in and say, oh, here's our solution. This will fix everything for you. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't ask that question. We just say, what do you want to use, and, and give them some options, typically. Yeah. Jim's in the guard. Do you let him touch anything? Heck no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, I didn't think that's so. That's a good question. Yeah, that, that, that's the toughest question on the panel yeah. today, right? <laughs> so, you, you let no, it. in fact, uh, I was able to answer one question in CyberShield here recently, so I felt <laughs> I thought it was the fastest on Google. That's the only reason. Um, no, but... Speaking of training, though, um, we're very fortunate because in North Carolina, we will train with our National Guard component. So as on a drill weekend, if you will, um, since we have a DCOE in North Carolina, as we're doing a cyber table exercise, Rob, uh, our deputy uh, state CISO, uh, Carly Sherrod, and others will come and train with us. So again, as we get that, that familiarity, that muscle memory, everybody knows who does what and, and those kind of things. You know, and as an example, one of our areas um, from t two years ago on CyberShield was um, in the Intel side. And I know that this past, um, well, last time we did this, um, a, a tabletop exercise this year, uh, Carly spent an immense amount of time with our Intel folks that are in uniform. This is how you read a threat briefing. This is how you did it. And, and this year at CyberShield, they rocked it. I mean, it, it, it paid dividends on that type of stuff. So it allows us to be able to see where our weaknesses are, mm -hmm. but we address our weaknesses collectively. And then likewise, the feedback we get from our colleagues when they're out, as much as they can tell us about things, because we are very particular about the relationship and protecting the privacy of the data that's being discussed. It also helps us, what are the areas of opportunity that we need to start addressing at the state level and maybe put, be pushing out some different types of training. So it does help uh, drive, as Rob's looking at security programs going out across the enterprise, what's, what's our area of focus, what's our priorities that we need to hone in on? I think to, to expand that training, um, we do ransomware tabletop exercises for anybody in the state that wants mm -hmm. to join. Um, and then our state partners are on to kind of give their feedback during the exercise. Um, and so we've done it for the community colleges, we've done it for municipalities, counties. We've also done specific training they've asked for. So continuity of operations plan, incident response plan, building those out. Um, and we've even helped them you know, build their own templates so that they can go through it. And it's, it's kind of a, an effort all the way across where each one of those agencies is on, each one of the JCTF 
agencies is on to talk about you know what their response is during during an incident response mission. And so we try to do as much training as we can because we really want to be what we say left of boom mm -hmm. uh, and do do more proactive. Um, um, training and, yeah. and have to get there in an yeah. incident response. And Doug, we talked about yeah. proactive and reactive support, right. but it's also important to call out as you know the the uh, political tensions just in the United States will lead to particular a particular emphasis on election security. So as we have whether it be primaries or the midterms or the generals, we are very fortunate to have uh, thanks to the Director of Emergency Management in North Carolina, Will Ray, a Joint Cybersecurity Mission Center physical location that is co-located on the grounds of the Joint, Fo Joint Forces Headquarters in North Carolina. So that gives us a single area of focus where we can come together. I can turn to my colleague to my right or to my left and not have to spin up a Teams call or WebEx and hopefully they're there and they can answer. We're together, we're in the fight until the end of that election that evening or earlier the next morning. So proactive, reactive, and specific incident support, and not incident in a cyber incident, but particular occasions to get together and train and use the training that we've built and the trust that we've built to effectively support major operations in North Carolina. I was just say, Doug, one of the things, yeah. um, it's if, if there's a problem area is we become victims of our own success um, and extricating ourselves out of an incident response. Um, because once our colleagues are there, they're boots on ground, they're, they're remediating the situation, that local entity doesn't want to let go of that resource. Um, and there comes a point in time where we have to kind of cut that umbilical cord and move on to other opportunities, I'll put it, um, and trying to get away from that. But we, at least since I've been uh, here in North Carolina as secretary, we have not had a local entity not say anything but, oh my God, what a relief this was that you were all able to bring these resources in, you helped us get recovered, um, we would not have known what to do. And so that word of mouth is also helping to spread. So even though uh, Seth's been doing some PR campaigning, um, <laughs> word of mouth is the best way of going. So at least that's something good as well. But to get ourselves out of the incident can sometimes be a little painful because it's, it's hard for that entity to let go of our, of our troops that are there. Robbie, you had something? You yeah, I, I just, we keep talking about partnerships, but there's one partnership we don't, we haven't talked about yet, and I think it's important. You mentioned Cyber Shield, but we've been doing this for about 10 years, but we, North Carolina hasn't been doing this alone. So I see a ton of my National Guard brothers and sisters throughout the, the audience, and we've utilized some of the plans that are already out there. We've been working with Ohio, we've been working with California, we've been working with Washington, Michigan, Arkansas. Like we come together too on the National Guard side of the house and we collaborate all the time. So when we learn things, sanitize the data, we ensure that we can share it and then we share it with others and then we take some of their good ideas and bring it to the table too. So you know, just a recommendation that if you're not doing that and harnessing the relationship, I would absolutely do that. Good point. So we, we've talked about uh, the receptiveness of, uh, of local governments to the services that you're offering. And again, we, so key elements that we've articulated before, which is the number one is you've got to build those relationships in advance of an incident. You don't want to be showing up and introducing everybody, right? So we've learned that for, for many years under incident response. But we, we, if you look at our data uh, from our 2020 survey, our Deloitte NASA study, uh, only 28% of the states said they had built a collaborative uh, extensive relationship with local governments. They, they hesitate to do that. So what's the advice from any of you? What's the advice you would to states who haven't begun that, that journey with their local jurisdictions? So in North Carolina, we have the University of North Carolina School of Government. And really, that's at the center of our relationship between state government and our local government partners. Dr. Shannon Tufts, who leads the Certified Government Chief Information Officer Program at UNC Chapel Hill is also a member of the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force. She brings that local credibility to every single incident response engagement that we have. So I would encourage you all, if you're considering standing up a similar mechanism or you want to improve your relationship with your local government partners, look for a, an area or a nexus, if you will, similar to similar to that in your, uni in your university systems where you might have a school of government or another similar body. Build those relationships there and there's also the League of Municipalities. Uh, a ton of opportunities or avenues to really build those relationships. 
Yeah, and establishing that relationship with local government is critical. Um, you know, majority of government services are delivered at the local level um, at the end of the day. And local government does run critical infrastructure. It's not always private sector that's running critical infrastructure, whether it's sewage plants, water filtration, those types of things. So you're only as strong as your weakest link. And looking at it from a state aspect or from a state um, within our borders, we really need to make sure that we're, we're reaching out, we're assisting uh, those entities as much as we can and building those relationships because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And we want to make sure that we're able to be there for when the when does occur. In the meantime, we want to try to be as proactive as we can in trying to get them moving forward. Nothing's more d distressing than having our National Guard colleagues go out, do a, a vulnerability assessment in which somebody puts in the filing cabinet, checks a box that says I did it, and six months later, and we have a real, real world situation in unfortunately North Carolina where they got burned to the ground by that, those vulnerabilities that were identified. Nothing was done with it. Um, so we're very much focused on how do we continue to sustain the funding streams. Um, it's great that we're getting these one-time federal funding sources, but they're one-time funding sources. So really working collaboratively and especially with our uh, General Assembly to get that reoccurring money to come in so we're able to sustain these things moving forward. So, yeah, it's great. We fix it once, and in three years, it's going to be broken again, if not six months later. So, so we have me, to make sure we're sustaining that. Because I was going to follow up on a question for, to you about legislative awareness and also uh, briefings to them. So what does your state legislature, and obviously, you know, talk to the governor, what does the state legislative body understand about the yeah, so the legislature is, is very much aware of, of the interaction that we have, um, especially since I've come to North Carolina and being a guard member and actually working with these gentlemen as well, it really has helped streamline some of that. Um, and it allows me to also be an advocate for what is occurring, not only from a state CIO side and supporting uh, cybersecurity at the state level, but again, also leveraging the talent that we have within our National Guard forces in North Carolina. We got some awesome people. So in that regard, it's fantastic. We are getting ready. Um, we're looking to, in the fall here, to actually have a closed door session with our General Assembly members that are interested in really, this is what's going on in North Carolina because we, ha we have some members in our legislature who, you know, they, they just don't grasp the, the enormity, if you will, of what's going on. When I sit there and say 13 billion events weekly um, that we're handling, and I had uh, a state senator look at, and you, you said billion. I said, yes, B, billion. Um, and that number continues to go. I mean, and we've seen, obviously, and I'm sure the other states have as well, since the um, geopolitical events have occurred, that number has steadily increased. Um, and, and so it's important for us to educate them as well. We've also talked about the, the fact of funding the enterprise, not funding individual agencies. So going back to something Governor Hutchinson said as well, um, the return on investment. If you're funding 12 entities to do the same thing, your return on investment is pennies on the dollar. Let us do it at the enterprise level and let's get the bang for the buck that we deserve. And then likewise, we can also build that depth and defense as much as we can as well, based upon what we know. The, th the landscape's changing um, and the threat actors, um, I think it's important for, and we all recognize this, that you know, um, if you're in a battlefield um, in armed conflict, you kind of know what the, um, the operating model is of, of your enemy. In cyber, you don't know who your enemy is. Um, it can be a, you know, somebody in their, the parent's basement all the way up to a nation state sponsored uh, threat actor. So um, as we're looking at these kind of things, it's just important for us to have that agility and be able to respond appropriately to those things. So again, we, we've come a long way and we've got a lot more work to do. So, so let's follow up on that in terms of, uh, and, and I've got a couple more questions, so I want you all to think about questions on the audience there, because we'll leave some time at the end for this panel to, to answer your probing and insightful questions as well. The uh, for those of you who don't know, in 2020, NASIO and uh, NGA collaborated on a, a report, a publication called Stronger Together, and it highlighted a, a, a number of states and what they were doing in building relationships and collaborating on the cyber side uh, with their local governments. And that was our assertion, our essential thesis of that report uh, after many conversations and working with our states is that the states needed to begin building these relationships. And, and three major recommendations, we've talked about two of them. One is make sure you extend and build those relationships. The other, which it seems like Seth is on the PR campaign, was to, <laughs> was to build awareness that this is not organic, that you can't just have this capability and expect the local governments to come to you. You have to really go out and market a, a marketing and a PR campaign. And the third thing was look at the scope of state services. 
particularly areas of enterprise contracts that may be in force, and figure out how you can extend those to local governments in terms of those master state price contracts. We haven't discussed that, so thoughts on what you all have done. Rob, perhaps you give thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah so uh, I think the native North Carolinian Luke Combs said it best when he said we're better together. <laughs> How many country music fans? No, nothing. <laughs> so we have provided uh, intrusion prevention capabilities to uh, over half or nearly half of North Carolina counties. And we, we particularly target those counties that are more financially distressed. And in the state of North Carolina, we have our North Carolina Department of Commerce economic tiering system that really helps inform and guide how we do roll out those services. The, that we can extend contracts and support to and provide a layer of defense where a county may not otherwise be able to provide it for themselves. So using that economic tiering system as a guide, we're able to extend intrusion prevention services and we'll use it as a roadmap for an upcoming um, cyber pilot that we're gonna be rolling out here at the uh, end of August. Yes. Um, you know, as Seth had mentioned as well, um, especially if it's a, gov a local governmental entity, uh, my agency is not at the forefront of the, uh, the, uh, of the engagement, but there are a lot of things that we can provide. So IT procurement's under me. Um, so anything that we can do to streamline procurements to get the agency recovered. There's certain services, um, as an example, uh, emails is a very simple one. So instead of the entity going out and uh, running off a of Gmail or something like that, we actually onboard them into the state's email system until such time that they're recovered and we can go ahead and move their accounts back over. So there's a number of those um, types of things that we do across the state on an enterprise level on a day-to-day -day basis that we're able then to extend out to the counties during their uh, period of most need. And so I, think, I think that's, again, an important consideration that many states uh, fail to realize is that they do have to invest time and resources. And, and the key thing there, quite frankly, across all the states is start with those local government organizations, the League of Cities, the League of Municipalities, the Association of Counties or Townships. Uh, every state uh, has groups like that that represent, and that's the easy target is to start with them. Uh, otherwise, uh, you will run out of resources very quickly if you're trying to work individually. How many counties North Carolina have? 100. 100. Yeah, so you, you, like I said, you're going to be booked up and not even get it to you know some of the large large cities and, and townships and things like that. So that's that's ve that's very very important. So uh, again, last question from me, and I'll probably talk to, to Jim, and he can he can talk about how he's going to give all this money to the guard. Uh, you mentioned IJ, so we have we as you all know, we'll have a session about this later about the uh, state and local cybersecurity improvement uh, act and the one billion dollar funding and the the various uh, eligible areas uh, and the requirements in that act, 200 million this fiscal year uh, from CISA uh, to the states, 80% of that has to go to local government. So more on that later, but I'm, I, I guess I'm gonna ask Jim to prognosticate. You all have had conversations, you're getting organized for this funding. How do you plan generally to, without giving up your baking secrets, mm -hmm. how do you plan to generally disperse these funds and what are you gonna, what are you gonna target year one? So again, uh, as I said earlier, um, our National Guard colleagues have basically done vulnerability assessments for about half the counties across the state of North Carolina. I think that becomes our basis. Um, our Nickel Jesus group, uh, the Joint Cyber Task Force, um, is basically our planning group. We have to add an uh, individual in from our Department of Public Instruction, so we meet the K through 12 requirement. And we just recently added our agency, CISO, for who's um, within the Department of Health and Human Services, so we have the public health um, requirement covered as well. But we already pretty much have a, um, a grouping of projects that are ready to go. Um, one of the areas that I'm looking at right now, and, and actually I've asked this, so the question is um, privacy. What can we do from a privacy aspect, especially with the 20% that's going to be for the state? Um, is that going to enable us an opportunity now to start building out some of our privacy programs um, and, and to start working with our local governments a little bit differently than what we have before? But I mean, that, that's, that's the critical mass of it right now. Um, don't necessarily have a dollar amount, don't wanna talk about a dollar amount yet as to what that will look like. But we have worked um, with the governor um, uh, and in his budget proposal that's there right now with the General Assembly, it is accounting for the corresponding cost match, so 10, 20, 30, 40%. So we're gonna go ahead and fund that at the state level and not have that be done at a state or local uh, level as far as accounting for that cost match. Um, when I look at what we're doing from the, our PSAP community and our 911s as they're, as they're putting in their remediation plans, 
and asking us to fund those. We want to look at a, a valid plan. We want to see how that plan is being executed. And then more importantly, getting back to the sustainability, we want to see how is that funding or what, what are you looking at to do? How's that going to get incorporated in your ongoing operational budget? So we're not just doing a point in time fix and then going to get burned a little bit later. Very good. Uh, questions from our audience members? Otherwise, I'm going to make these guys play Wordle. Okay. <laughs> but no, use the, use the microphones, please. Anybody but the node, no. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, heard some great conversation around two major topics, I believe. Uh, hopefully, that's what I heard. One was around assessment and incident response. Share some thoughts on security operation, like continuous monitoring from a whole of state perspective, if you are currently thinking on that one. Yeah, so what we have seen, and I, I don't want to step over uh, my National Guard colleagues, but what we have seen exactly as it was characterized earlier is the assessment occurs, it's on the shelf, no actions taken. And the frustrating part about that, frankly, Vinod, is that some of the remediations that are called out within those assessments are no or low cost remediations, but they just simply were not actioned. So assessment, the assessment uh, process is a cycle and it's not a destination. So the continuous monitoring piece to extend beyond just what agencies may have hosted in their environment to their contracted third party providers is an absolutely essential part of increasing our maturity across the state. That's the challenging part is keeping with all of the challenges that are facing North Carolina with our cyber, pi you know, cyber talent pipeline uh, being of a uh, high interest for our IT strategy board, we need to make sure that through our continuous monitoring processes we, with, that they're nimble and they can, they're responsive. And also that they are reflective of the limited number of resources that we may have. So we might wanna make sure that we're not pivoting from thing to thing and putting fires up, but rather having that maturity built into the continuous monitoring process so we can account for any, any shortfalls of uh, resources. I, I, we, we, I was gonna say, we stayed away from the tool discussion on purpose because mm -hmm. we can go down, but we are looking at next gen tools. So how do we leverage machine learning, AI, to move from a reactive mode to more of that proactive mode? There, there's another important point when we're talking about the assessment piece and how we craft our message during an outbrief of the assessment. Right, to get to that continuous monitoring. So a lot of times we'll work with that IT director, um, CISO, um, and craft a message during the outbreak for the senior leaders in that organization to say, hey, if you had three more people, you could really build your vulnerability management. You could have more eyes on your infrastructure. And we have seen great success in that, in, in that by say, you know, highlighting, saying, hey, you guys are missing the low-hanging fruit. If you had two more people, you could really make an impact here and secure your agency. And I can tell you, we've, we're already on the second um, round of assessments uh, on some counties, and then we're into the pen test. And the improvements we've seen from a first to a second assessment, especially with those that, that took that proactive approach and said, hey, these are the results. If I have more people or I have different resources, and, and they go to their leadership and they ask for that, and we're happy uh, from a guard standpoint to assist in that conversation and explain it and say, hey, you guys really should focus here. Um, and, and we've seen a huge success from that, and that helps in the continuous monitoring to bring more people in to dedicate towards that. So it's really a messaging thing from our standpoint, and we'll craft it however that agency wants within reason. As long as it's, as long as it's a real thing, um, we, we will make sure we highlight those areas. Um, you know, and, and we have, a lot of times, you'll have somebody that's familiar with our organization that, that takes a new role. Um, and the first thing they do is call us and say, come give me a snapshot of where we are right now so I can go to my leadership and say, I need X amount of resources to make this right. So, so, so in, Seth, in general, when you're looking, because I think that's important, when you're looking at these assessments without attribution in any one county, mm -hmm. do, you, do what's the, I would say most, most of the local governments have, it's a failure in basic cyber hygiene for the most of them. Is that what you're finding? And, that, and as you look at the assessment and you you're looking at those recommendations around some of the basics that they need to address before they move to the next step? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a cyber hygiene issue and it's a resource issue. Um, you know, you can't separate the two because a lot of times in these counties, either they don't have an IT department or their IT department was the guy that, that could turn the computer on the fastest. 
Um, you know, and that's how he got the job, is he was good on his home network. And so cyber's kind of an afterthought, or it, they just don't have the resources um, to dedicate towards it. So yeah, absolutely the basics. Vulnerability management, I would say, uh, network segmentation are the two things that are, you know, typically lacking. Patch management, uh, passwords, yep, yep. administrative privileges, right. go down the list, right? right. And, and so we have a list um, of the top, we couldn't get it to 10, we have 11 uh, recommendations that, that we make, um, to, you know, uh, almost always, and, and you know, we, you know, the, I, I want to say the first probably 20 um, assessments we did, um, they were prevalent. They were they were in every single one of those, uh, like disable auto run. You know, that was on, on every one of those, and it's just these little tiny um, things that that could be fixed. Um, but yeah, it, it, absolutely, that's it's it's the basics, and if we could get to the basics, uh, I think we could really make some improvements. In the meantime, while while they're doing that, um, from a state side, yeah. we have to do a better job of educating like county commissioners and the elected leaders as to why is this why is cyber important. Decision -makers. I can remember having a conversation yeah. with a Western County who was nobody's going to care about my county, right? You know, you know, just kind of like nobody cares about us. We're not going to become a cyber attack. We're not a, a point of interest, and it's like until the commode doesn't flush, there's no water. <laughs> so, so you have to yeah. get them to understand this is a business risk. I say business yeah. risk yes. of the continuity of government discussion and, and take it out of that. That's the importance of whole estate fundamentally is Correct. that it's, it's a business Correct. risk and local governments particularly are part of the ecosystem and for they need to be stronger mm -hmm. for the state, as you said, for the state for the state to be stronger. Correct. So in that, re in that regard, my NACIO team is going to cringe right now, but I, I'm the moderator, so I get to do this. <laughs> uh, is one of your recommendations your local governments move to .gov domain? If yes, it's not, I'm going to ask you to put it on the list. No, it is. Talk about that. It is, and it is. Okay. Uh, we get we get a lot of movement to .gov, especially after an incident. Good. The reality, yes, and that's how yeah. we're reconstituting those networks is by moving them to .gov. So that so the by the way, for those of you who will hear this later, it's part of the uh, state and local cyber grant. One of the uh, eligible. Well, I think it's number I is the transition for local governments, entities in general, but our states are there, local governments to .gov, 90% of the eligible jurisdictions, 90%, that's over 36,000 local governments, cities, counties, townships, fire districts, all of those that are eligible to .gov, 90% of them are not on .gov today. So NACIO's on our advocacy campaign to obviously promote that from the from the state side but we think that's again critical to secure the environment for those local governments to begin that it's a 10-year journey so i'll have brown hair by the time we get there but it'll be back and we'll be back so i'm glad you're saying that because that's important to uh, the nation that we move these local governments to dot gov so other fact, questions i would add doug that if yeah. there's frustration that i can't as state cio sign off that i still have to get that local elected official to sign off if it's at, at that level. I just can't do it at the state level to, Correct, yeah. to get they, them reconstituted faster. They've got to apply for that, but yeah. we've got the registration fee. Is There's no fee. There's no domain registration fee, so there's no reason. Uh, the excuse that I have to change all my business cards doesn't fly mm -hmm. with us. So <laughs> anyway, but that's that's what we hear. So other questions? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Terrible against the DHS system. Uh, so first of all, just phenomenal young men stepping up there on stage. <laughs> All right, I'll start. Uh, so number one, um, I'm going to take your question and feed it into her question as well. I think it's essential from a state perspective for us to see ourselves, right? So from a preventative perspective, the assessments are important, what we do with it, but actively, right? The threats are changing at lightning speed. And so I would say from, from a state visibility perspective, getting to the point where we are sharing information faster and easier without the authorities being in the way, in a sanitized way where no one is assuming risk, because that's what everybody's worried about, whether it's cyber or whether, whether it's physical threats. Sharing information, and private sector is the same way. And I think for us in the next five years is, how do we continually grow that partnership on the private side as well? Because critical infrastructure just doesn't sit within the government. We're all well aware of that, right? It was talked about by one of the governors with gas prices. 
So those are considerations. I think we've got to figure out how to break down those barriers. Uh, it's really, really important, at least the way I see the threats changing at lightning speed, our ability to identify those threats across the state and then say, hey, here's the best practice on how to fix that, whether it's solar winds or other examples. Um, I think that's one of the areas we've seen immediate return on investment mm -hmm. was when we could see ourselves across the state, we had a sanitized response. You said 10 things, or, or sorry, 11, 11 things, things right? 11 <laughs> things to share. Well, we do that from a threat perspective as well per incident. And I think that's one area. I think continuing to grow the partnerships, I'd love to see us partner more with other states as well. Um, I think we are working on that and talking about EMACs and, and utilizing the emergency management framework, how we respond to hurricanes when you need this from other states. I'd like to see that grow. And I think we've also um, we've talked about historically having that one place. We now have a room to respond, but what other partners can come together where we grow it to a building or grow it to something else where we're all sitting together and sharing that information in a sanitized way. Um, that's just my two cents. Yeah, uh, I think one thing that's important to call out too, in, you know, in improving that communication channel with our federal partners, uh, we've run into situations where different offices within the state for a single partner are not aware of what each individ individual office is doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's absolutely essential. And you know, as we move forward, that the collaborative space is very important. And as we mature our Joint Cybersecurity Task Force and take that next step, I think it's important to continue to be, you know, looking out for our, our you know, keeping the pipeline of cyber talent coming in and making participation in the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force an attractive option to that new college graduate or that, you know, transitioning military member who, you know, is looking for a career after the military. So the pipeline is going to be absolutely essential in maturing and taking our task force to that next level. And you left out military and I spouses. think the other thing that's important, we talked about governance, but I think, uh, again, for everybody out there, the evolution from that informal conversation to an MOU. And again, many states do not have that. Some do, mm -hmm. but I think that's important that you have a construct, you have a, a governance framework that's articulated. MOUs are shared expectations between partners, and I think that's important. Um, just between us guys right here, they're a pain to work with, I know. I would used to be there so they can be power hungry, right? They got customers, they got agencies, so that's just between us. They don't know that, but uh, we, we know how the state agencies often feel about the CIO as their partner of choice, right? So that can be, uh, that can be problematic, but I think the, the theme here today is really about relationships, and you're, you're not going to develop those relationships looking in the mirror. And I think that's important for all our state agencies, our state CIOs particularly, is you've got to look out the window and, and, and look at all those opportunities. And again, educating the local officials can be extremely difficult, as Jim mentioned, because they don't see this perhaps as that, that business risk, and you really have to turn it into those terms uh, because they think it's about technology. Uh, and that's why they just said, well, my IT director or my, my county CIO is going to handle that. Well, no, they're not because they're under-resourced, as we found from, uh, from the guard assessment. Yeah. So any further questions, we wrap it up. OK, one more. All right, go I'll ahead, just Scott. Long, huh? Yeah. So um, stock targets in Vermont, we see um, recognition at sort of all levels, military side and civilian side, that partnerships between the two sides are a good thing. But we continue to struggle with sort of the institutional inertia that doesn't allow those two to come together. <laughs> what was the secret sauce that you guys really used to get yourselves over that hump? I like to think that it was my shining personality. <laughs> um, so we have a memorandum of agreement between the secretaries for the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Information Technology that dates back to 2018 that really facilitates that process of getting soldiers uh, and airmen from the status that they're currently in to state active duty status. Uh, Colonel Felicia? So none of, that, none of that happens without trust. And you can't build, I can't, I can't say this enough, you cannot build that trust. You can, but it's rough, in the midst of an event. So I think the key for us was going in prior to an event, doing one assessment, building the trust with that agency, not releasing the report to anyone else, 
handling the data appropriately, and then the word of mouth took off. And it, it just takes that one time to happen, and then it was like, okay, wow, they're not gonna share, and, and again, it's not just DIT, it's all entities. No one wants to share with higher states, don't wanna share with feds, and so on. So knowing that they have a trusted partner up front, I think before an event takes place, was key. I think another point to that is that that, that MOU, but this is in particular for the National Guard, there is no bureaucracy for us to jump through when there's an event, right? They call and say, yeah. can you help? We come, right? I don't have to wait for the governor to declare an emergency or anything like that, so that they know they can count on us to be there. Um, and I think that goes across the board, is that all of us will be there, but in particular, we, we're just not beholden to waiting, waiting yeah. around for somebody to say go. They call, we declared an incident, and we're on the way. Um, so I think that that really helps that, to be available um, you know, and bring that expertise, that, that trust, um, that we're going to bring the right people and we're going to do the right thing for them. And for my colleagues out there, well, that's loud, across the state, um, I would suggest you go and meet your tag. Um, I'm surprised how many of my colleagues across the country don't know who their tag is. So if there's any tags out in the room, Please go out and reach out to your state CIO and state CIOs. Please go and introduce yourself to your tag and start that conversation because it's a heck of a bench strength that you're not tapping into as a state CIO um, that the National Guard can bring to bear. We were fortunate in some cases that folks in, in you know, even Rob's predecessor, um, all former military. So we understand the cultural aspects and some of the challenges that need to go with that. Those are not insurmountable. I'm not saying that you need to have that, but that then probably helped open some doors a little bit. But to start getting those conversations between the adjutant general and the state CIO, I, that needs to occur now if it hasn't occurred already in your respective state. One more point, I think, from a DPS perspective and a DIT perspective, the two agencies working together, utilizing framework that previously existed us responding from a guard perspective, following the way we respond to a hurricane, through emergency management, standing up a, a team, that we didn't, we didn't change any of that. We, we followed the framework that was there. People were comfortable with it. So as we matured, we just continued to follow that process. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's important from not only our perspective as the provider of the capability, but also from the supported entity's perspective not having to remember, well, if it's a cyber incident, I'm gonna do this, but if it's a hurricane, I'm gonna do this. Yeah. So that same, you know, funnel the request the same way, and we'll respond accordingly. I told you all that we would get great information from the state of North Carolina. You wind them up and they just go. So uh, I think that you've learned a lot. I think uh, that's the important part of having these conversations. So please join me in thanking our panelists.